I do, I do scleral lenses in my practice every single day. I have tons of patients um, successfully using scleral lenses. And I know in speaking with the beer that at the eye specialist hospital, you have a long waiting list of patients waiting to get in to be fit with scleral lenses and you want to make the fit as quick and simple as possible. So hopefully um, with this lecture, I will be able to uh, give you some tips and tricks to take into practice tomorrow that you can use to be more successful in getting that patient in and out the door and happy um, with their fit. So just briefly, we've fit scleral lenses. I am sure you fit scleral lenses as well. Um, you know, they can, scleral lenses have been a godsend to us in the past 10 years with the technology that's come out to really take care of our patients with severe cornea diseases, keratoconus, corneal transplants, um, radial keratotomy. Um, we have a lot of that here in Arizona. Um, I wonder if you see that as much as I do. Um, but anything that really distorts the cornea can be corrected uh, to a great degree with scleral lenses. And the benefit of using these lenses over using a rigid gas permeable lens or even a hybrid contact lens is that they're just so comfortable. Um, and even patients that have been using rigid gas permeable lenses for years, even though it's still a great modality that I do in my practice, and they're still, they still will come and tell me, I'm still a little uncomfortable. Like they're just not as comfortable. Um, with scleral lenses, you don't get anything into the eye um, that can irritate you. And so you can correct both visual issues and um, treat some dry eye while not having that discomfort that you did with previous lenses. Um, as you can see from this list, we also deal with a lot of patients with severe dry eye disease, such as Sjogren syndrome, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, where the ocular surface is really aggravated, um, and graft versus host disease. So those are all things that um, we deal with on a, a daily basis with scleral lenses that they can really help. The benefits of these lenses are A, vision correction, which we all know. We've seen in our practices, people going from not being able to see to being able to see with scleral lenses. And it can be almost like a miraculous thing that happens. Um, we can also with these lenses treat dry eyes, which is really wonderful for patients, especially with severe dry eyes, such as exposure keratopathy, the Sjogren syndrome, uh, et cetera. Because once you put the lens on, even if it's initially dry, which you will hear from these patients, they'll put them on and say, oh, I'm still a little bit dry. And you say, just wait, um, just wait a couple weeks. It will feel a lot better. And then they come into the next appointment saying, oh my gosh, this is the best thing that I've ever done for my eyes. And uh, it's really awesome and miraculous. And uh, with patients with exposure keratopathy, or um, maybe they've had uh, something happen, such as a seventh nerve palsy, an acoustic neuroma, um, some condition where their eyelid doesn't close all the way, we can also offer the benefit of protection with the scleral lens. So we protect the ocular surface so that it doesn't become damaged, dry, um, even in really severe cases, it developed neovascularization. Um, and the last bullet point is just temporary healing. So some of these patients can be healed with scleral lenses used therapeutically. We have some instances of patients who say they have a non-healing corneal ulcer, potentially from um, a herpetic uh, condition. If you put a scleral lens on the eye and you wear it all day, you do take the, the lids, the insult of the lids to the cornea away from that patient. So they're able to start healing again. And once they heal up, sometimes you can just take them out of the scleral lenses and, and they don't have a, a, an ulceration and don't have them happen as often, which is really amazing. But with any great thing in life comes complications. Um, when we're fitting scleral lenses, I always tell my patients, we are fitting a rigid structure around a soft structure. And that is just going to give us some things that we need to uh, think about when we're designing these lenses. That's why 
you know, it's really difficult to get the perfect, perfect fit on the first lens that you ever put on a patient's eye. It can be done, but it is a lot more difficult when you're dealing with someone who's going to take this lens out into the world, wear it, and they're going to have some things arise that you didn't see in your exam room. Um, I have patients where the lens will look absolutely perfect in my office, and then they go and wear it for a couple of weeks, and they're like, oh, I'm having some redness temporarily. What can we do to fix that? And it's something that I didn't predict. It didn't look like it was going to happen, but it did. So with these complications, as long as we can um, look at them and fix them for the patient, then we can be very successful in scleral lenses. Um, the list here that I have are all of the complications that I see pretty regularly. Um, people coming in for co consultations who are already wearing scleral lenses and my patients. The ones that are highlighted, lens dropping, fogging, and contractile redness are what I think to be the most important, um, most important complications to deal with first and foremost, and they are the most common that I see in my practice. The other bullet points are things that can arise from, from, from these main three topics. So if you have a lens that's dropping, you can get discomfort, you can get painful removal, you can get conjunctival um, redness, et cetera. Um, and the last bullet point, corneal edema, I know a beer had mentioned to me that um, you have some, a lot of patients that are post-surgical, um, probably corneal transplants if they're in your office. And um, they, you have a lot of advanced corneal conditions as well. Um, corneal edema with a corneal transplant can occur. And it's one of those complications that I always talk to my patients about when they first come into me for consultation. I say, you have a corneal transplant, the scleral lens is the, definitely the best option for you at this point in time. Maybe they've tried other types of lenses like rigid gas permeables, et cetera. Um, and we discuss, you know, what are the benefits of the scleral lens versus potentially developing corneal edema, which doesn't even happen that often, but it can. So if you have any questions specifically about post-surgical eyes, just put them in the drop the box below and we can discuss them at the end because they're a little bit more niche and I do have some suggestions, but this presentation is going to be too long. So I just did a couple of them today. So lens dropping is the first complication that I'm going to discuss because it's one that you will see every single day if you're doing scleral lenses. The minute you put on a lens that doesn't fit the patient correctly, it will probably drop. And it will probably drop in a very specific way that we can actually fix right off the bat. And it avoids so many of the other complications. If you can fix this one thing, then you will avoid all the other complications that arise from it. So what is lens dropping? You can see on this eye that this eye is wearing a scleral lens and the lens is not centered. The lens has actually dropped inferiorly. So there's more lens inferiorly than there is superiorly. As we know, when we're, de uh, when we're designing scleral lenses, we look at the clearance between the lens and the eye, and we try to make sure that that clearance is enough, that it's not going to be touching the eye. For this patient, you can see with this lens, if you think about where the clearance is gonna be, it's probably going to be much, much closer superiorly than inferiorly. And that can cause some complications because if you look at this eye and it's dropping, you think, okay, I'm going to, increase the clearance so that I get more clearance superiorly because it looks like it's a lot closer. But when you do that, you're also going to get clearance inferiorly and you're gonna get more and more and more and that can cause some, some issues. This is a picture of one of those issues is when the lens drops down and you have a lot of clearance inferiorly, you can not only get um, you can not only have the lens that's resting really harshly on the inferior conjunctiva, so the inferior conjunctiva will actually look like the lens is too tight, even though it's really not tight, it's just a heavy lens that's dropping down on the conjunctiva that is cutting off those blood vessels because of the weight. Um, and as you can see with this patient, this patient has kind of those suction forces. You have so much clearance and then 
under the lens, because of that clearance, it actually creates a suction force, which sucks the conjunctiva up under the lens, and it makes the lens um, and the conjunctiva really, really irritated. So why does, uh, why does this matter? Why does it matter if a lens is dropping? If the patient is happy and the eye is white and quiet and you have a little bit of this dropping, it's not a big deal. But with this lens dropping, you can see a lot of issues that if you just center the lens better will clear up on their own and you don't have to go through four or five, six different lenses trying to clear up different things. Um, the lens dropping, it matters because it is, uh, you know, the difficult, it is closer superior nasally. And so if the lens drops a lot, you can have a lens that's actually touching the superior nasal cornea. And if the lens touches the superior nasal cornea, it gets irritated and um, it can damage some of the limbal stem cells there. And a lot of times with these lenses, even in regular patients, it's really hard to avoid the closeness superior nasally. I will see patients in my office all the time who are coming from other doctors saying, I'm pretty happy. I just want to be evaluated. And I'll look at their lens and I'll say, it's touching superior nasally. So yes, we should refit you in a different lens eventually, you know, eventually. Um, it could cause some long-term damage to the limbal stem cells and irritation to the eyes, um, maybe even in advanced cases, some ulceration of the cornea, but that's very rare. Um, but these patients are coming from really good doctors. They've been fit very well, um, except for this one unavoidable complication if you don't know um, how to fix it off the bat. So, um, this also causes discomfort inferiorly around the conjunctiva, like I was mentioning, and the poor alignment of the lens actually results in a drop in visual acuity. And this isn't necessarily something that we would see in patients who have really advanced disease, who are going from not seeing to seeing again, because those patients will probably be very happy. The patients that I'm talking about are patients that are much more, um, observant about their vision, maybe they're not, they don't have vision that is that bad. Maybe they can be corrected with a scleral lens to 2020. They have keratoconus, but they're still saying, ah, I'm 2020, but it doesn't feel like my vision is that good. I'm having lights that spread out a lot. When I look at something, it, it kind of doubles a little bit out of this eye. And you look at the lens and you say, it looks well fit. It looks like it's a good lens. I don't, the, there's no prescription change that's needed. What do we do with these patients? Why are they still not seeing well? And there's two things that it could be. Basically, the first thing that it could be is that the lens is dropping and decentering, taking the optics with it. So if the optics is in the center of a lens and the lens is decentering, then the clearest optics are actually going to be um, off center from your pupil. So you can see from that left picture, the line of sight is uh, skewed nasally in most people because of the angle kappa. Um, and then the contact lens op optics are actually decentered. And so this patient, even though they're seeing well, they're just not seeing as well as they could. And so the more centered you can put this lens, the better. And why does this happen? If patients ask, like, why, why do I have this lens decentering or, you know, why isn't my vision as good as it could be? It happens with every patient, regardless of how advanced their corneal disease is. It happens with normal patients. It's because of the insertion of the extraocular muscles. They all have different insertion areas. And when you look at an eye, generally what you're going to see is that the nasal side where the medial rectus is, that area is going to be much flatter. So it's going to come up higher. And the lateral side is going to be steeper because the muscle is inserted where it's going to pull more. So you're going to have this steepening of the lateral rectus more than the nasal rectus. So the sclera is going to kind of look like this. The superior and inferior rectus generally pull um, more than the nasal and temporal areas. And so you're going to have a much steeper eye superiorly and inferiorly 
than nasal and temporal. And we're just talking not about the cornea again, we're talking about just the sclera and what the sclera looks like. So when you're fitting these lenses, why does it, why does it always um, decenter inferior temporally? It's because nasally it is flatter. And so it's going to push the lens um, laterally. And then the weight of the eyelids and the weight of the lens is going to drop the lens inferiorly. So you have that temporal repositioning because of the medial rectus, and then you have the inferior decentering because of the weight of the eyelid and the weight of the lens. So the number one, here's how to fix it. And here's what you, you should do with all of your patients who come in um, on their first lens. I always order these things right off the bat because 85 to 90% of my patients are already in very specific characteristics of lenses. Um, the number one thing that you're going to do is decrease the overall central clearance. If you put a lens on in the office and you're, you have 700 microns of clearance, when you look at the eye, even though it clears everywhere, you're going to see the lens drop down and you're going to see there's impingement inferiorly of the blood vessels. Again, this could be just because of the weight of the lens. This doesn't necessarily have to mean that the lens is too tight inferiorly. And that can be something that a lot of people try to fix right off the bat. But in reality, again, because superiorly and inferiorly, you have a steeper sclera, you're actually going to make the lens steeper in those areas. But if you look at it and it's dropped down and it has all the weight bearing inferiorly, you're going to think that you need to flatten the inferior, um, the inferior peripheral curve when you don't. So if you put a lens on and you're looking at it on the eye and you have an excessive amount of clearance right off the bat, please go and put on just a different lens. Um, time permitting, of course, um, because I know that you're probably very busy at the hospital and sometimes you just need to put a lens on the eye and make some changes totally understand um, that as well. And I do the exact same thing. But if you can, and you have enough time, just put a different lens on, look at the peripheral curves. Um, this left picture is not mine, but you can see that the green in this picture, you have a lot of clearance. This is probably like 700 microns of clearance right here. This is a ton um, because the, the cornea is generally 500 microns. So you can um, evaluate the, the fluorescein as, as slightly more than that. The right um, eye is actually a picture of one of my patients with keratoconus. He has a mild to moderate form of keratoconus, so it's not, it's not terrible. Um, but you can see superiorly, centrally, and inferiorly, he has the same amount of clearance all the way throughout, which is really great and very helpful. <laughs> um, and so he was pretty happy right off the bat. We maybe changed a couple different things because um, I tend to be a perfectionist. So, uh, but he was very happy and uh, we have a lens that fits really well. The second thing to do, to, and I think the most important thing in scleral lens fitting to this day is aligning the edges of the scleral lens with your sclera. So aligning those peripheral curves with the sclera is going to help you immensely with any fit that you do, period. And again, 85% of my patients have toric peripheral curves, meaning that the peripheral curves of the scleral lens are different elevations depending on if it's superior, inferior, nasal, temporal, etc. cetera. Um, the lens on the left, you can see what I'm talking about where it drops. So when you do your optic section in the slit lamp, you see superiorly there's very little clearance while inferiorly, there's a whole lot of clearance. And on the right, you can see a picture of one of my patients who has a, um, who has a corneal scar from a fungal infection. That is, a, that is a very small amount of clearance, but it is throughout the lens, very equal top to bottom, meaning that the lens is very well centered and this patient is wearing their lenses successfully. So I wanted to go through with you, if you're looking at a lens in the office, what is my technique for designing this lens to avoid these complications and to maximize the peripheral curves and make the peripheral curves as, as good as they can be? So you can see again on the right, that's my patient who had the corneal scar from a fungal infection. They are a normal cornea. However, 
they have a very toric sclera, which is something that um, the cornea and the sclera do not uh, affect each other at all. You can have an extremely normal cornea with an extremely toric sclera, and you can have a spherical sclera with a really um, disfigured eye. So it really doesn't it doesn't go with each other. So you can't really predict who is going to have um, the need for toric peripheral curves and who's gonna have the need for spherical peripheral curves on the spiral lens. So this patient to the left, you can see this is my technique in the office um, and something that maybe you do in your practice and something that I would definitely recommend doing is these circles. Just draw on a piece of paper, a bunch of circles. These circles represent the right and the left eye as you, the doctor, are looking at them. This patient only had a left eye, so I only had to draw things for their left eye. When the patient comes in, I put on this um, custom stable uh, Valley Contacts Elite lens, which means that the sclera lens out of the fitting set had toric peripheral curves. And I fit it on the eye, I let the eye and the lens settle a bit, and then I took a peek at what the lens looked like. So you can see all of my notes to the left. It looks like chicken scratch. Um, I will look first and foremost at the clearance. How much is it clearing the eye? So this lens to the right is his finalized lens. This lens to the left, um, the notes are all from my initial lens that I put on in the office. Uh, so you can see obviously his final lens didn't have 300 microns of clearance. It's just the lens that I first put on. So I write down all of the clearances. Is it getting close? If it's getting close at an area, I will circle that area and look a little bit harder to see if it's something that I need to fix or not. But this patient, because I put on a toric lens, it rotated to the degree that it was going to rotate towards. So you can see this, um, this lens rotated 45 degrees. And I just marked that on my circle. Um, and then I took a look at the flat and the steep meridians. And the flat and steep meridians, the flat one was a plus three and the steep one was a minus four. I'm gonna go over that a little bit more on the next slide, but you can see all of my markings here. I put the over refraction. I put, um, is it impinging on the blood vessels? Does it look, does the edges look flat? Um, basically everything about the lens that I could, I write down on this piece of paper because it helps me visualize what the lens is going to look like for the patient. And it's much easier. Um, and I think you can be more creative than if you just are doing it on the electronic medical record and writing it in. Sometimes I'll forget or my system will crash and I'll lose all my data. And this really helps me with that. So this is the actual technique for peripheral curves. So I put a lens on the eye, it's toric lens. This, these are the parameters of the, the, the fitting lens. It rotated 45 degrees, so I marked that. The red circle that you're seeing, that's the flat meridian. Um, the flat meridian on this lens, and I believe Abir said that you do have the custom stable at your um, hospital. So this is one type of lens that you can use, but most lenses that you will be using each step of difference in the peripheral curve. So flattening and steepening is about 30 microns. Um, to get a significant change, if you're looking at something, you have to do about 60 to 90 microns of a change. So I don't generally do one, to, one step of flattening or one step of steepening. If I see something, I usually go um, two to three steps flatter or two to three steps steeper right off the bat because it's just gonna save you time. A lot of people's sclera are more toric than you would think. So if you're looking at the red um, circle, you can see that there's a plus three. That means that it's three steps flatter than the standard edges. And, but you can also see that I wrote here, I put one plus impingement. So this was impinging on the sclera. If you look to the right of the, um, the arrow looking to the right, this is the actual change that I made. So I went from a plus three to a plus five. So I went two steps flatter because I did see that impingement of the blood vessels. Um, I went 60 degrees. Knowing this man's final lens, I think I could have gone further, which is why I say to you, start off 60 to 90 degrees um, increment. So two to three steps each time. And that will really help you because going in small steps is just gonna have make the patient come back. 
Um, if you're looking at the bottom lens, you can see the green circle. This is the steep meridian of the lens. This is quantified on this lens as a minus four, meaning that it's four steps steeper than the average standard curve, um, which means again, that it is also about 120 or so microns steeper than the average. But if you look up to the top left, I said almost too flat. So I thought uh, it looks fine because usually flat edges look, look okay, um, but it's almost too flat when I did the optic section and I was looking at the side of the lens, I was seeing that there was some shadowing off of the side of the lens. And when it shadows, it means that there's enough space to kind of get between the lens and the eye, which is why it looked too flat to me. So I ended up steepening the lens by just one step. So I had a plus five and a minus five. I thought this would give a good balance to the lens. And this patient was very successful. So this is something that you can do when you're looking at patients in the office and you have the ability to put on a toric lens and see how it's looking. The next technique is actually in the slit lamp. So say you don't have a toric um, lens to put on the eye. Say you just have a regular lens with a spherical uh, peripheral curves. That's totally fine. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put that lens on the eye you're gonna make sure that it doesn't have enough, or it doesn't have too much space between the lens and the eye. And you're going to smear fluorescein on the front of the lens. So if you can put this lens in without fluorescein in the bowl, it's generally pretty helpful. If you've already put on the lens and you had the fluorescein in the bowl and you put it on the eye and you're looking at the fluorescein, you can put on some lysamine green or rose bengal stain, which are the green and red stains that we use usually for herpetic infections. Put those all on the front of the lens and then immediately go into the slit lamp. Don't really wait on this. Go into the slit lamp and look and see, is that fluorescein or rose bengal or lysamine green, is that being taken up under the lens at any points? If it's getting right up under the lens very quickly, um, we call it fluorescein seepage. Like this um, picture to the left, you can see that this fluorescein is going under the lens superiorly. Harkening back to another slide, uh, remember that superiorly, that um, lens or that eyeball is generally needing something steeper. So if you have a need for something steeper and you're getting a lot of fluorescein seeping up under the lens, obviously this edge is too flat. You're going to need to steepen it. And superiorly is most likely where you will see um, this happening. Um, on the second picture to the right, you can see the opposites happening. This edge is too steep. This edge is impinging on the blood vessels. It's cutting off that circulation. It's probably going to give the patient a red, uncomfortable eye. And so this edge is going to need to be flattened. So you can see the left one, this is an edge that needs to be steepened superiorly. And this on the right hand is an edge that needs to be flattened nasally. Abir had mentioned to me that you guys have the Pentacam, which is an awesome piece of equipment. It's really wonderful. It gives you great views. It allows you to see um, keratoconus before it starts, uh, before it's uh, clinically observed. Um, but it can also help with some uh, lens fittings. And so I know that you don't have this right now. I don't have any financial um, benefit from this company. So no financial disclosures. This is just something that I use um, and something that you could use too if you decide to get it. Or you can just see for the future, if this technology becomes available to you, this can help you fit lenses uh, easier and with less um, time observing in the slit lamp although it's always beneficial to do that too. So this is the Pentacam Corneal Scleral Profiler. This is the same machine. It is just a software um, upgrade. So you just get this software and the same Pentacam takes a picture of the sclera. So it has does scleral topography. Um, it shows you the different elevations on the sclera. You can see on the lower right-hand corner, there's that picture of the eye. In the very center, that's the cornea. This is a patient that had radial keratotomy surgery. So they have a very irregular cornea in the center, but you can see that outside of that central ring, there is a really bright purple and 
superiorly and inferiorly, and really bright red um, nasal and temporally. What this means is that this sclera is very, very steep, superiorly and inferiorly, just like most people, and it's extremely flat nasally and temporally. This is actually the patient that I had who had the flattest and steepest eye that I've ever seen, scleral topography wise. So fitting him with a regular lens would absolutely never work. And I'll show you the top right-hand corner. This shows us the, um, this scleral topographer shows us the different elevations of the sclera. So you can see here, I, I drew it out with that red circle. Superiorly and inferiorly, you have a um, 47 degree and 49 degree um, slope. And so that's very steep. So that means that it's sloping more and you're gonna have to curve that edge of the scleral lens around the eye more. Nasally and temporally, it's the exact opposite. It's very flat, meaning that you have to flatten out those edges nasally and temporally. So with the lens that I fit him in, we go from a zero, we have a, the ability to go flat 12, so 12 steps flatter and 10 steps steeper than, um, than uh, normal. So we go from a zero, we have like flatter and steeper on either side. This patient ended up in quadrant specific um, peripheral curves where you can do four different peripheral curves, nasal, temporally, superiorly, and inferiorly. Um, and that's because when I originally did the lens, I think I designed it with toric peripheral curves. So steeper here, flatter here, but same amounts. And then nasally, it was still impinging. So nasally, you can see he has 30 degrees and temporally 37. So that's seven degrees of difference, which is so clinic, anything above a three is like clinically significant. So I did flatten out the nasal even more, but say you don't have this technology and you're in the office and you say, okay, this patient is having a lot of impingement here and a lot of lift off here. What am I going to do? Again, I would go further than you had wanted to. I wouldn't do a couple steps. I would do, if you're seeing a lot of lift off and you're seeing a lot of impingement, just go for it. Do like six steps steeper, six steps flatter. It's going to make an, a, a lens that waves a little bit, but it's going to look a lot better on the eye. Um, and this patient ended up with uh, some peripheral curves that were 600 microns difference between the two, which is really crazy for a conventional scleral lens. Um, this patient's very successful. He's super happy. Um, he has a white and quiet eye, which is what we want for all of our patients. So this is technology that you can use to help you. But again, with the other slit lamp techniques, you can also create a lens with these types of parameters without having to have this technology. It's just very helpful to have. The other technology that maybe down the road you could implement um, just to get people out the door faster because you have such a long waiting list of patients is a scan-based scleral lens and a mold-based scleral lens. These are both scleral lenses that take scans of the eyes and molds of the eyes, and then they create a scleral lens based on those impressions and those scans. So this is a, a woman that had a scan fit lens. This is also a radial keratotomy patient. Um, you can see on the edges of these lenses that it's waving a lot. So she had two pinguecula, pretty large pinguecula, but this lens is bumpy and lumpy, just like her eyeball. So it's just more, um, it's, it fits the eye better. And when you get these, these peripheral curves that fit the eye better, the lens dropping is not going to happen as much. It's just going to be a centered lens with a really, um, uh, with a central and mid peripheral clearance that is very uniform, which is what you want and avoids a lot of issues. This is the mold based scleral lens that we use in my office. This is the iPrint Pro. It's the only mold based lens that's out there. Um, you can see me on the right. Uh, this is me with a patient that had keratoconus. He um, actually was in traditional scleral lenses, but he was always having this temporal redness. And I did everything. I probably got him 15 different lenses and something about his eye, the anatomy of it was just bizarre. We, it was very rare. I couldn't do anything about it. Um, so I ended up switching him to this and he's very happy now. Um, he doesn't have that redness. The lens is much more comfortable. So for some patients that, you know, you can do everything you can with a conventional scleral lens. 
And if they're still having a lot of issues, it is nice to be able to move to these different modalities instead of just changing and changing and changing a lens, which we all get in the habit of doing because we want to be, you know, we want to give our patients something that's perfect and that they love and that's fitting them really well. Um, so you can see on the left too, this was a patient that had a really, um, uh, a really protruding corneal transplant. And this is like the lens is completely lumpy and bumpy, very bizarre looking, um, <clears throat> just an awesome looking lens. And so moving into um, any questions that you have on lens centering, um, please put in the, in the box below and we can talk about that. But getting the lens to center using those peripheral curves and an appropriate clearance is the number one thing that is going to make your practice uh, better, take it to the next level. Um, the more precise you can be, the better. And again, my practice, I'm, I'm still getting closer and closer every day to getting patients out in one lens, getting patients out in two lenses, instead of, I used to get patients out in three lenses, four lenses, et cetera. <clears throat> but there's a lot of other complications. So let's talk about the second one. Uh, the second one is fogging. And fogging is something that I'm sure all of you have seen in your clinic when you put the lens on and it looks great and the vision is great and the patient says, oh, after the course of a couple hours to eight hours, my, my vision gets blurry. And um, when I blink, it kind of like moves and then it kind of goes away and comes back. Um, and it only goes away when I take the lens out and re-clean it and then put it back in. So this is fogging. This is just um, naturally when we fill up the lens with saline and we put it on the eye, um, it's clear. And then our tears are eventually going to replace that. And our tears carry lots of things in them. They carry little epithelial cells that have sloughed off. They carry um, proteins, lipids, uh, different types of um, cells. Uh, and so when these get up under the lens, just depending on how much we have, um, it's just going to create this fogging. And so the components in the tear composition you can see listed um, we're still learning about this, uh, this uh, composition um, component of the actual fog. Um, it's still being researched and um, you can see with the leukocytes, um, potentially an inflammatory component to people that get a lot of fogging. Um, the lipids, potentially a real a dry eye component. Um, cell fragments, uh, I put epithelium question mark because this is just something that I hypothesize in my clinic is that I think that patients that have really severe ocular surface disease, they have the irregularity. When they blink, I think that they'd slough off more epithelial, epithelial cells than the average person. And so kind of that abnormal cell turnover, I think can still get stuck under the lens. That's why you see a lot more, in my opinion, a lot more patients with radial keratotomy or any type of surgery that's really surgery or um, scarring that's really uh, gotten that ocular surface very irregular, um, they almost always have some sort of fogging. If you can get them to eight hours and then it starts fogging, that's fine with me. I mean, I tell patients with radial keratotomy and with severe dry eye and with really bad allergies, I tell them, hands down, 100%, you are going to have at some point in time, this lens is going to become foggy. Um, this is, this is what we can do about it. But from my end, I design the lens as good as possible to avoid that fogging. And then the rest of the things that they can do, taking care of their dry eye, et cetera, that's on them. And, but I always set up the expectation that there is going to be some fogging, um, so that the patient isn't surprised or disappointed. So why does fogging happen? So there are, again, these are just things that anecdotally we've noticed in clinic, um, there was a recent 2020 study published, um, I think by Muriel Shornack, and she looked at all of these factors and said that basically none of these factors contributed to more fogging. So um, who knows, right? But this, these are the kinds of things that anecdotally we do see in clinic. Um, they are too much clearance. The lens is too tight, too loose. The edges aren't aligned. There's really bad ocular surface disease. Ooh. And so here's how we here's how we actually fix it because we just take a lot of these anecdotal things and we think how can we actually fix this person? So aligning the scleral haptics that's the number one thing we already talked about that. This patient off to the right has um, this is a keratoconic eye. This is one that I fit. 
he is a very torx flare up but um he's doing really well you can see the edges are perfectly aligned um as good as possible right um decreasing the central clearance as much as possible also really helps with fogging so getting that more central um that central clearance to a good area and then treating the underlying surface issues so um, starting the patient who has dry eye on a dry eye protocol, warm palm presses, um, taking omega-3s, doing regular artificial tears, just the regular stuff. You can start a patient on this before they get their lenses and they'll be much more successful. Um, medicated drops such as we have here in the States, um, Restasis, Cydra, and Sequa, which are like immunomodulator drops for anti-inflammatory conditions with dry eye. Um, you probably have somewhat similar things there, maybe different names, um, but things that you can do uh, medicated wise. And then patient expectations, like I was saying, tell them that they're gonna get a little bit foggy, make it normal, um, but just tell them when it gets really foggy, just take it out. If they're fogging up after eight to 12 hours, totally fine, that's normal. If they fog up after an hour, that's a fit issue probably. And then solution changes. These are some solutions that you can have your patient purchase. Again, they'll probably have different names, um, but some of a drop, an artificial tear that's preservative free that is more viscous than the saline. Uh, so Refresh Relieve is one that I love. Cellu Viscous, super viscousy. Um, I almost like Refresh Relieve a little bit better. Um, and Nutrafil, there have been studies that have compared regular saline, the sodium chloride 0.9% to Nutrafil, which has added electrolytes. And people get less fogging with Nutrafil, probably because it's closer to the pH of their tears, maybe a little bit better dry eye treatment. So patients with very severe dry eyes and with radial keratotomy, generally I put them on Nutrafil right to start out with. Um, and I'm nearing the end of my time. So I'm gonna go through the last one a little bit quickly. Um, conjunctival redness. This is the la this is the third and um, the third most common complication that I believe you will see in practice every single day. Um, and there's a couple different things that I wanted to talk about. The first is what we talked about before, impingement of the blood vessels. You see this lens, it's obviously too steep. Um, we just need to look at this area and flatten it out. That's number one. But say you have a patient like this. This patient had an extremely squishy conjunctiva and they had um, some, what I believe to be lymphatic retention. So they just had this um, conjunctiva even before I put a lens on. So always look at the conjunctiva before you start fitting them with scleral lenses because you can tell which patients will have a lot of settling and a lot of irritation before you even start fitting them. And then that way you can order a lens with increased clearance, et cetera. So this patient had just a lot of fluid retention. His conjunctiva was really squishy. The lens settled a lot, like settled about 400, 500 microns. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, but I looked at the edge and I said, this is a really irritated edge, but it's aligning and you can see over here on the left-hand side, this is a picture of the edge of the scleral lens and their conjunctiva. This edge is aligning. This looks really good. It's not too tight. It's not digging into the sclera. It looked really good. But I looked at the edge and I said, okay, if this man has a very squishy tissue and this edge of the lens is that thin, maybe that thinness is just pokey and it's irritating his conjunctiva. So what I did was all I did was have the lab um, thicken up the edge of the lens. So you can see on the second one to the right, this is the thickened edge. And you can see over to the right of the lens, it looks like the conjunctiva is super irritated and it is, but it's because this is, I put this lens on the patient after he had worn the first lens to the left. So he was very irritated to begin with. Then I took the picture. When I had the patient come back with the thicker edge, his eye looked like this and it looked really good. Um, he has a little bit of a pinguecula. That's why you see the loss of blood vessels right close to the limbus. Um, it's not uh, it's not like an impingement of any sort, but so this patient, after we let that newer lens with a thickened edge settle, that was really helpful for him. Um, so it's something to think about is, are the edges that you're ordering too, too thin? I've had, uh, after noticing this, I noticed it on a couple other patients that I switched to a thicker edge and they did much, much better. Um, and this is a, this is my last patient, very interesting kind of niche patient with conjunctival redness. Um, this is a patient who had radial keratotomy. So their central cornea was very flat. They had about 
I think their central K is worth 30 and 32. So very, very, very flat average, you know, is about 45. Um, and no matter what I did with this is a, this is a, this is a custom scan based flare lens. So we went custom for this eye. Um, and no matter what I did, she was getting, it looked perfect on the eye and I let her go home and she would come back with this redness and she was moderately happy. It was hard to remove the lens. Um, but she was pretty happy, but I said, this is unacceptable. This is too much redness for me. Um, I think it's irritating your eye. And I think it's because the suction forces were too great. Her eye was so flat in the middle and then anything mid peripheral was going to be more than that. So it's kind of sucked that conjunctiva up under the lens. And she had a lot of redundant conjunctiva. So conjunctival chalasis, it just got sucked up under the lens and it was really, um, I didn't like the look of that at all. So what I did for her was I made the lens bigger. I think she started out in a 15.5 millimeter. We did a 16.5 or a 17 when she came back. Um, I decreased the limbal clearance, which I couldn't do. This patient was pretty close to perfect, as I said before. But if you have a lot of limbal clearance, um, decreasing that will avoid that suction factor. Um, and adjust the overall clearance. Make sure your clearance is not too excessive and then you can adjust the diameter. Um, and off to the right, that's her with the new lens. I like this a lot better. I still think it could be better. I am ordering another one for her. She is happy, so she could technically be left alone. Um, but be again, because I am a perfectionist, I, I tend to tweak around a little bit more than my patients probably would. Um, and so this lens to the right, hopefully I can make her just even a little bit wider, a little bit more quiet, um, and just a little bit easier to take off. All right, I hope that uh, some of that information was helpful and something that you can take into seeing your patients on Monday and um, fit them with success and get them out of your chair a little bit faster. Um, I really appreciate you having me. Um, if anybody, again, has any questions, we can take them now. And then if you have any questions in the future, please feel free to um, email my office. Uh, you can see the email right there. Um, and my staff is happy to help you and pass along your information or questions to me. Thank you, Dr. for amazing lecture. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experience uh, with the secular lens. And now I would like to ask the audience if they have any questions for you. So if there anyone have a question, please don't hesitate to, to ask in the chat below. So anyone have a question? Yes, Dr. Muhammad. Hi, uh, good morning, Dr. and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, lecture and information you provided to us. Uh, my question is regarding the design. Did you prefer the, the custom design or are you starting first with the patient, I mean, with the patient with the regular uh, design and then think about the corner screen mapping and doing doing uh, the impression. So what do you prefer in the beginning? Yeah, so what I do in my practice is um, I do, I have a consult, so I map the patient and we talk about all the options. And I say to them, based on what I'm seeing, here's what I think you're gonna be most successful in. If they're a patient that's relatively, um, you know, a pretty easy fit, maybe they have, some peripheral uh, curves that are would be a little bit different. Um, they could really go with any of these lenses. If they have really large pinguaculas, um, that's something that I say, uh, maybe we'll start you in the scan or impression-based scleral lens because it's just gonna be a faster and easier fit for both of us. Um, if we do a custom with large pinguaculas, as you know, you, you have to move over those um, or to avoid some redness. So I do offer patients that could probably be successful in any of them. I do offer them the option to choose between them. And a lot of my patients actually nowadays, they say, okay, um, you know, you say that I'm going to be successful in the conventional scleral lens, but 
you're saying that there's a potential for me to see and um, be a little bit more comfortable in a custom. I'm just going to go custom right off the bat just to just to decrease my chair time and increase my chances of success. So um, in those kinds of patients, I will let them choose. There are some patients where um, they're very irregular. And I just say, I think this is going to be your best option. Um, I'm happy to fit them with whatever they want, but I do give them my, my opinion. So um, I think that you can be successful with most patients with a regular scleral lens if you're really well versed at fitting it, which you guys are. Um, but you know, even that normal patient, even a regular patient like me who wears sclerals, I'm going to be a little bit more comfortable in a, in a custom design, just like you'd be more comfortable in custom clothes. It's kind of like that. Yeah, great. My second question is about the filling the scleral lenses with the normal saline. Uh, did you prefer using a normal saline as a first line or uh, you advise the patient to use a uh, a lubricant, a free, a lubricants. Uh, did you feel any change between the normal saline and the lubricants uh, in terms of the comfort and the duration of uh, wearing the contact lens? Yeah, actually, yes. Um, so generally speaking, when I have patients who have tried multiple different kinds, they they generally do like um, the the there's there's like three types of salines, right? We have the unbuffered, which is the sodium chloride 0.9%. And then we have the same thing, but it's buffered. So it's closer to the pH of our tears. And then we have the third category, which is buffered with added electrolytes, which is like the neutrophil. The, the middle ranges um, in the US are called sclerophyll and lacropure. Um, potentially they're the same or a little bit different with you guys. Um, the patients that have tried all of them, they tend to like the buffered solutions better. Um, and feel like they're more comfortable. Um, but again, because these lenses are not uh, cheap, um, so they, you know, they're a little bit more on the expensive side here. And the filling solutions, um, each individual uh, saline becomes a little bit pricier when you go up. So I always give patients the choice. You can start out here. If you're having issues, go here. If you're having issues, move move forward. But again, some patients, if I give them the option, I always give all of them the options. They just start out with the better one because they want to just minimize their chances that they would have to switch. But yeah, in my experience, I have had, um, I have, and, and I wonder if you, you've noticed the same thing. Okay, the, thank you for your answer, doctor. We have a question from uh, Dr. Osorio. So um, his question is, do you have experience in patients with a post in prosthesis? Um, say that again. Do you have experience in patients with post in prosthesis? Yes, I do. Um, I've never fit them with scleral lenses. Uh, when I used to deal with a lot, uh, a significant amount of keratoprosthetic patients, in New York City. Um, I worked for doctors that did that procedure. We would usually do either one of two things. We would have a soft contour lens, um, a soft Acuvue Oasis lens for the bandage purposes. Or what I would do was, um, because you know the lens is uh, turns your eye blue, essentially, or the keratoprosthesis turns your eye blue, a lot of those patients were very self-conscious. And so I would fit them with a, um, uh, Bausch & Lomb Alden Optical Prosthetic that has a, a tint to, you know, the brown tint to it. So if the patient had brown eyes, then we could match it to the brown eye and it could be used as a bandage lens and a prosthetic lens. Um, I know that there are friends of mine who have done sclerals for keratoprosthesis patients, but I never really found the need to. And here's why. Um, either the patient's vision was very bad and a scleral lens was not going to fix it because it was retinal, it was glaucoma. Um, a lot of these patients have concurrent glaucoma, as you know, and so visual potential with a scleral, I don't know about that. Um, and a lot of them, uh, the ocular surface was relatively smooth. So if I put, say they had a prescription and I put like a minus three into the lens, the bandage lens, we could get good vision anyways. Um, so yeah, that's the, those, that's the main kind of uh, lens that I would fit on these patients, but scleral lens, you definitely can. Um, it's just that usually because these patients have also the glaucoma filtering surgery, 
I would really recommend doing um, the impression-based flare lens if you have the op opportunity because it'll just fit them better and avoid compression. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, so is there anyone have a question? I think we reached the end of uh, our webinar. So thank you very much again, doctor, for our amazing lecture and I hope to see you again. And thank yes. you all for joining us for this valuable webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Have thank a great you. day. You too.